Welcome to the Alapra Podcast, the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. The train's leaving at half past seven? Yeah. Of course it is. Oh, we're on the podcast again. Oh no. <laughs> I thought she was leaving at half past seven, you know that? Yes, I know, but I was just confirming. Okay, great. So we are in the beautiful Campo de Naciones, the field of nations. True. Yeah, there's a bit, guy from Benin over there, another guy from Eritrea, Argentinian behind me. <laughs> Everybody's just filling out this gaff now. So, uh, there's a free train. Uh, but before we talk about the free train, you were actually here when this park was first opened. No, I wasn't here. <laughs> I just remembered when they put it on the news that they were opening it. Ah, okay. In 1990, no? Uh, early 90s. I can't remember exactly, but yeah. Your dad took you here. Yes, my dad brought us on a bit of a trip. Uh, it's actually great. If you are visiting Madrid or if you live in Madrid, uh, I would recommend coming to this park because obviously Casa de Campo or Tiro, they have their charm, but also full of tourists and uh, runners and people, puppet shows, and that is great in its own right as well. But this is a bit more uh, quiet. serene, quiet. Yeah, yeah. there's a le- like far less people here. And very beautiful sculptures, kind of funny ones, tongue-in-cheek ones, lots of animals. We saw a turtle. <laughs> a few ducks horrible in, in fish in water it wasn't just like walking around <laughs> lots of animals we saw a turtle I saw a turtle at the vending machine they getting a bottle of water <laughs> well, it was no quite wonder. quite the sight um, so yeah so here we are as the last podcast of season 5 then we're going to take a two week hiatus um, and we'll be back with season 6 it is summer holiday time so everybody bring your bucket and spade uh, to the beach Where where are you going for your holidays? North and South. <laughs> North and South? Yes. That could be anywhere from Iceland to New Zealand. <laughs> Just in Spain. Just in Spain. Okay. Um, and you're going to ask me where I'm going? You're going home. I am going to go home. To your second home. Uh, I'm not going to go home to my first home. <laughs> Ireland. Uh, so, you know, Spanish lady. In the... Yeah, okay. You, you in don't, logical order. You don't, you don't have my, um, my, my citizenship or my heart. As a country, even though it's a great place to be, I'm very happy in Spain. But uh, you can take the boy out of Ireland, but you can't take the Ireland out of the boy. Definitely. Um, okay, then, well, we're going to talk about different things in part two. Uh, so please do enjoy this musical interlude, and we will be back with more of that aforementioned stuff. <laughs> aforementioned stuff. <laughs> Welcome to part two, and uh, Mary, you have a special shout out to uh, Mr. or Mrs. Radio Public. <laughs> well, no, it's just that uh, if you listen to us on Radio Public, you support us doing more of the stuff you like and we like to. Very excellent, great work. Uh, <laughs> so, so far it's been all filler, now for the trailer. So, you, uh, congratulations, you've been, uh, you're, you're almost on the point of submitting an archaeological article uh, somewhere. Can you tell us more about that exciting news? Oh, yeah. Um, no, it's just a report of, part of the report of um, the dig that I was in in February, back in February. And, well, I'm just submitting the part to do with mud break. Okay. Uh, and also, you have a, there's a website that tells you when people use your, uh, they cite your article yeah. in their well, thesis. Well, academia.edu is like quite a common uh, website for academics. And you just put your papers there and then it's a way of people, so that people can access them for free once they're out of like copyright or whatever. Okay. 
or if you want to put them, you know, because uh, you haven't published them or whatever, you can put them there as well and just follow the people. And it's a good way of, um, uh, you know, meeting other other colleagues and stuff like that. Meeting our colleagues for networking. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes you know, if you're after a paper that you cannot find, or you want to know more about uh, some results from an archaeological dig that aren't published yet, for example, you can get in touch with them. Okay, I because I've written a thesis as well. You're not the only one. Do you mean your master's dissertation? My, no, it's not. It was named Phil. <laughs> I was just waiting for you to say what uh, it Which is halfway between a master's and a, and a PhD. Is it nice? So you can actually convert your info into a PhD. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, so... Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, there's no, there's no space for being a snob in the park. So <laughs> it's too pristine and pure. Uh, but I never, I generally never knew about that website, though, academia.edu or com. Or <laughs> what you do? Dot edu. E-D-U. E-D-U, all right. Like edu, edu. It is a pretty good resource. Um, so, yes, that's pretty exciting. How many times have you been published? Um, I don't know, in total, like 10 or 12. That's that's pretty amazing, though. Well, <laughs> it's all right. No, it was, it was good. I mean, I don't know. I, it's um, Getting policy is really difficult in reality. So, so, yeah, you have to appreciate when you manage to do it. And the turnaround is, like, especially in academia, is very long, isn't it, for getting articles published? Yeah, that's why now when things are turning like more towards um, digital publications, I think are a lot better, you know, because the process is a lot faster and you don't need to go through all the printing and and it's cheap, cheaper and it's just more open to everybody. So that people like open access journals are far more popular now. Yeah, Jay sort of lost their monopoly on everything then. Well, there's been like huge, uh, huge problem, uh, controversy like recently with. Um, El Sevier, for example, which is a very famous science, uh, like editorial uh, publishing house, and they, um, they, they, well, they were basically making a lot of money out of the authors, and then the authors are not really making any money, but they're making a lot of money from charging people for accessing the journal. Uh, and it was just extortion, and, and it's come to a point where people just got too fed up. And they're basically saying, well, I'm, I'm taking off my paper or I'm putting my paper open for everyone to download and stuff like that. And there's a real sort of like war on the web going on, uh, um, trying to stop this. Backlash. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now a lot of people are saying, well, we've had enough of all the, all the people making money for our research, you know, which is fair enough. I mean, well, the thing is, uh, like, life in academia is pretty excruciating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good way of describing it. <laughs> well, uh, not to, you know, sit in the fence or anything, but, uh, <laughs> no, but the thing is, like, now more than ever, uh, it's very hard to get actually, to get into it, and even when you are in it, uh, yeah. you're expected to do a lot of work that's either unpaid or very badly paid, and uh, it's not very financially rewarding, and it seems like a huge slog. Um, and a lot of competition, obviously, for those permanent spots that are in university. So I think any reports I've seen or, yeah. or anecdotes from people involved in trying to get established with a permanent position in university, yeah. it's always been a tale of heartbreak and woe. Yeah, it's one of the main destroyers of life, you know. It's a strange system, though, because I think uh, it's not really healthy because some people really do spend their like entire you know formative years and they're building their career in that university bubble and it is a bubble and I don't think it is really helpful because people do turn weird uh, sometimes (laughs) Uh, even a weird to sound uh, exactly Uh, like my brother for example oh the joys of recording outside Uh, you're trying to say your brother's weird no 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 (laughs) Uh, no I'm saying yeah yeah, it is and Phil and now he went, you know, he went off and published books, and now he's doing his PhD. So he took a break and did real life stuff as well. Traveled the world, got married, and all that kind of crack. Uh, but no, you don't have to get married, obviously, before you do your PhD. It's not a prerequisite. But my point is, I think you should definitely take a break, step back, and do other things before going back into it because I think it's very easy to fall into that track of like just being in that university bubble, and I think you do yeah. lose a bit of perspective. Uh, well, he's quite lucky to be able to do well, yeah. what he did because yeah. you know, taking a break more often than not just pushes you off uh, the whole thing, you know. Yeah. So it, it, it's hard to do that, but you know. well, fair play to him. Well, it depends on what your um, well, it depends on what your 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 expectations are or what you want to get out of it. 
if you want to get a job, money. It, or for your money, <laughs> definitely don't stay in academia. Then, uh, yeah, but if you know, if you want a position, no, if you want like a position in university, then yeah, it's probably very unlikely then that you would get it if you take a break. So you have to keep pushing. So that's that's a fair point. But I think uh, if your job is, if you want to do, if you want to be, I don't know, professional historian or be a professional author uh, and do, yeah, if you can look enough to support yourself through that, which is not always possible, but my brother is doing it. Uh, or do other things and also publish a research on the side if that's possible as well then I think it, you can take a break um, and it's it's important as well because also as well the PhD is very very long process of, of studying and, and researching and it's a very emotionally taxing uh, <laughs> kind of like uh, uh, ride as well so So you've been in the position of being sensei, mentor to um, tutors, not tutors, but to PhD students in the past in the Computenza University, or some university in <laughs> um, Do you, you always get my university wrong? Um, so what are the things that you felt compelled to, to advise them about, to warn them about, the guidelines that you gave them? What, what was... What was important for them to know about this path that they were about to take? Well, you just have to be aware that um, it's a long process, and you know you have to. Um, well, you have to be constant and disciplined, and but also like you need to take it easy mentally because it really puts uh, a lot of stress into your life and. You just have to learn to manage it. I think that's that's probably one of the best things that I got out of the PhD, more than the actual degree, was, um, you know, just learning to manage stress and deadlines and generally controlling uh, <laughs> the course of a very long project, because at the end of the day, it's like you're working uh, for something like that is going to happen in like four years' time, so it's very easy to just let go and leave it all till the end or whatever which of course doesn't work so well uh, that's what happened to a guy I went to university with I used to live with him and believe it or not because I don't drink very much he thought I was up myself until he realized that the beer upset my tum tum sometimes and he goes okay fair enough because that's what happens in Ireland you need to have a genuine medical complaint before they even consider that you don't drink yeah, exactly accepting it as a moral question uh, but that's what happened to him he was doing a PhD on Samuel Beckett uh, or as someone said before Samuel Beckett because they weren't too enamoured with his uh, his works even though uh, he is uh, a ledge of the old theatre writing but uh, but yeah he was definitely leave, leaving go on, on the slide uh, but it's just like I'm sorry but it's kind of like a bit like it's a bit funny that you're doing a PhD on Samuel Beckett and then in the end Nothing happens. Nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you, he should have got this thing. He's marvelous. I mean, if he the had, guy's a genius. If he had the the, the Leorodi, if he had the stones to to per, to, to, per, to persist with it, and then <laughs> in his thesis defense to say, yeah, nothing exactly happens. Boom, Beckett. <laughs> um, it would have been fantastic. It yeah. would have been epic. <laughs> waiting for Gado. Waiting for your dissertation, my man. <laughs> Uh, he's in, he's ridiculously well read. He knows a lot of like uh, like Milton and like medieval poetry and all these things. And okay. I remember we used to, we used to my other housemate who also lived with us. He set up a, a football website, a football blog, and he wrote one uh, article uh, comparing Ronaldo to the, to the Greek character Narcissus, uh, staring at his own reflection in the water. And it's filled with so many words I had never seen before. <laughs> Uh, which is a very it must be good then uh, it was amazing yeah uh, if you can't understand it it must be good um, but yeah so like he he's, he has it back on track now but but for a while he was definitely leaving it slight and then that can really affect uh, your your well being because you're feeling under pressure to, to get things done but also as well it depends mm. on your tutor of course because they're not always oh, yeah. uh, helpful of course um, but the thing is as well uh, like when I was in university we had a officer for the student experience he wasn't a student he was just a an employee of the university and he said as well like a lot of things you get out of university aren't necessarily academic related as well so uh those things that you learn 
have transferable skills to to other parts of your life as well. So, mm. uh, and you know, did they ask you any questions? <laughs> no, not really. I mean, that's the thing. I don't know that. Well, I, I don't know. I would have appreciated having somebody to warn me about a lot of things that I found out by myself. Yeah. But then again, I suppose that's you know, when you start, you're sort of like innocent. You don't know what you're getting into. Um, perhaps it's better that way, <laughs> because uh, otherwise it might put you off from uh, doing it. You know. The thing is, as well, obviously. The thing is, as well, obviously, is that um, you know the subjects that we've studied, history and politics, and in your case, archaeology, are sometimes the forgotten uh, children of academia. I mean, I remember I did Greek and Roman uh, in my first year of university. I think they sent letters to everybody, basically saying, "Hey, please come back for a second year." Uh, so don't. That's just the GPS in the background. <laughs> so yes, technology. Say this is what I think of your humanities. And your history and all your other subjects like that. Uh, give me an engineer uh, any day of the week. But um, yeah, so like they were obviously desperately looking for students because they had lost students. They were, you know, there's a real threat that they would close down as a department and they wouldn't be able to run anymore because it wouldn't be viable. But as a PhD student, uh, in, a, in a subject like that, you really are fighting. Uh, not only are you, you know, doing for personal things as in getting a PhD and maybe contributing to, to the wider knowledge of course because as you mentioned earlier that academic website but you are really keeping it alive and going back to previous topics and other podcasts it's like a speaker of a language that isn't uh, living or as vibrant as other languages like by, by the sheer act of living it and speaking it you're keeping it alive and by being a PhD student in this field you really are kind of keeping it alive as well so I mean did you ever get a sense of that when you were doing the PhD that you were part of the fabric of of making it a living thing and maybe even feeling some kind of pressure associated with that as well well for me that's the only thing that really made it worthwhile the fact that I knew for a fact well obviously everybody that has a PhD is supposed to be bringing in something new but uh, some of them are just a different take or whatever but what I was doing what I was recording I knew for a fact it never been done before and also like it had a social uh, social importance, you know, because like recording like traditional uh, traditional architecture in Egypt, traditional ways of life that were disappearing, was important for the people that lived in those houses. So, so that was the most rewarding thing for me that it actually what I did, although ultimately the thing the, the aim was uh, archaeology oriented, the actual uh, data collection and all that actually helps put some people uh, on the map and that was for me that was important you put people on the map <laughs> well you know just because like they're very abandoned apart from being very poor they're just uh, yeah they consider like poor country bumpkins not not part of the, the fabric of the country so so it was just nice to be able to to record the culture that's good um, in fact, I always reminded of my thesis, my MPhil, before you say anything, today, because I listened to a BBC podcast about the uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea war finally coming to an end, um, and there being flights between the countries, people being reunited, phone calls being done between the two countries as well, because the phone lines were blocked as well. You had stories of people flying to other countries to phone people. Uh, in either Ethiopia or Eritrea, for example. But one of my uh, chapters, so I divided my MPhil into different chapters. One was focused on the United Nations, and in 2001, Ireland had a seat on the Security Council, which had, uh, you know, they were able to pin Britain and America to certain human rights standards before they invaded. Uh, they went on their invasion round uh, that year. But also, as well, uh, they played a fundamental part, Irish diplomats and Irish uh, human rights advocates in the government, uh, in kind of maintaining the ceasefire between Ethiopia and Eritrea, Eritrea in that year as well. So it's kind of like a, an example of how, you know, conflicts big and small, uh, Ireland's been able to kind of play a part uh, <laughs> in keeping the peace. So there, well, I didn't put anybody on the map, but. <laughs> still, well, uh, no, I mean, that's. You know, it, it, it's still a very significant work. I mean, there are things that, I don't know, in the end, like social sciences, apart from like uh, research, are about making a difference, I think. You know, in like actual uh, living uh, population. So, so no, that, that's fantastic when you 
when what you do can actually have a, an impact or or what you're studying is the impact that uh, some people can can still can still play you know so uh, did you get can still have. did you get in trouble for writing too uh, creatively in your uh, in your thesis at the beginning I did actually <laughs> because the way you write in Spanish and in English is very different and in Spanish it's a sign of like a good writer, a good academic writer to actually, um, you know, be, be very, I wouldn't say redundant, but to, you know, go be around the bushes for a long time, trying to explain the idea rather than going to the point, you know, it's, it's actually like... I mean, you have to be clear, but the more kind of like adorned grammatically, the better. And at first I had some problems with that because I just made it too complicated when in English it's far more like, you know, A, B, C. And that's very true. My, tu my tutor told me that to, to, you can do the Stieg Larsen stuff when you're when you're finished. <laughs> but while you're in here, son, sunny Jim, yeah. uh, you write a bit more academically. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. But yeah, the joys of it. Yeah, so it's a creativity killer, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is a little bit, but I, um, I think it's always fun as well to work in uh, certain flourishes wherever you can. We can get away yeah. with them. Normally in the uh, in the acknowledgements. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is basically the only space where you can have a license for that. Oh, uh, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's a lot of interesting stuff about academia. So best look uh, with your publishing career. I look forward, I watch this space, I'll be looking forward for your uh, academic articles on mud brick houses yeah. in the future. Yes. Uh, so uh, watch this space, someone's going to be a supernova star oh. in the academia world. Okay, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that little bit of uh, music between the, the first section of part two and this is the, the final section of part two before we go into part three. Uh, so there's been moves aplenty. So in, in previous podcasts we referred to the Pepe uh, scandal, uh, the, the fall of the government basically, but now there's a new leader. Uh, enter the man, the myth, the Casado. Well, this guy... Um well, I don't know if he's uh, intelligent, uh, but uh, I don't think he is, to be honest. But uh, he's uh, clever in that he knows how to position himself. Uh, yes. Um, which uh, I think he's a bit of a hanger on. And they all. Um... And he basically, yeah, I mean, he's a guy from like a small uh, provincial town and. He's just been climbing his way up. I'm uh, not entirely sure through whether legit me <laughs> methods or not. Um, now this is a, a shift to the right um, for Pepe. Now Pepe are already on the right, but it's yeah. a, a shift even more along the right spectrum. Yeah. Uh, one of the things he has proposed is perhaps rolling back the abortion law and making abortion uh, what based on the 1985 code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, what is the 1985 code? Uh, well, I mean, before it was just, uh, well, it was just like not allowed. Basically, the only, the only um, uh, circumstances could be like serious uh, danger uh, for the mother or the or the baby, or basically like very strict medical reasons that had to be justified. Okay, um, so I, like, I think a lot of people, well, a few people that I've spoken to are shocked I think by by this because it seems like such a regressive move for uh, a modern country like Spain because Pepe as I said, have always been right and he, obviously you can have different leaders that will shift it maybe a little bit more left a little bit more center or a little bit more right but this seems like quite a drastic measure um, do you think this will actually go through? Well, I mean this is like just part of his program the same as the euthanasia yeah. He, was, he wants to make it even more restrictive, but I think I mean I think he's just want to appeal to um, to a whole lot of like uh, Pepe voters that were like 
disenchanted because uh, that kind of turned more sentient. Yeah, uh, in a way. Yeah, you know? I understand that, but like for me, right? Looking at Pepe, for me, um, their big issues are just three things: the corruption scandal, obviously, which brought down the government, yeah. uh, Catalonia, and then the economy. Uh, for, so those are the three things that I, I, I would have, I would have thought that for for a Pepe leader, that they would have to be seen to be taking a position. Uh, on those things that, and that's what would garner more support rather than something that's a little bit you know left field perhaps because this wasn't part of the public conversation before he was elected really so yes but I think I mean I think it's like pure strategy because what he's trying to do is to like gain more of the right voters and and, and a lot of people that were conservative were uh, a lot of people that are conservative, it's not just about the finances, it's also about like the ethical issues and he's just trying to win those people back. A lot of them are like elderly voters yeah. that actually are like a huge proportion of uh, the party, but that, how can I explain it? Yes, there's corruption and all that, but you know, if they have to choose between corruption or the values that they believe uh, should uh, prevail in Spain, then they will choose the values. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's kind of like it's a bit of a paradox, but but that's how how it works. No, I understand. It's a big gamble, though. I, again, it's not that surprising because you very often do see conservative leaders banking on what they're doing to gather support from their core followers, and then they don't care if they alienate other people in the country or even internationally. And you look at Berlusconi, for example, or even Putin. The things that they've done have kept their core support happy but have really annoyed people uh, domestically and abroad as well so I, I, th I think that's that international dimension is probably a factor or will be a factor because I mean look at New Zealand for example the other day uh, they passed a law which gave people leave if they were victims of domestic abuse for example Ireland passed the abortion law so this whole Me Too movement these are very kind of progressive things that are happening internationally and to, to kind of take a position that's so at odds with the international discourse uh, takes a lot of um, stones as well, I think. Uh, I don't mean in a, in a in a praising way, but um, it's a big gamble as well, I think. Well, but I think, I don't know, somebody pointed out something interesting, um, saying that, you know, the more progressive movements there are, the more reactionary uh, uh, movements there, there are in, in response, you know what that, I mean? That's so, very true, because the more alcoholic anonymous as it can be found in Ireland. <laughs> so you know that that that's how it works. So some people actually get very scared of changes and of things that they perceive as the world that they know changing and and and, and them losing their essence or or whatever. You know, there's a real problem with yeah. identifying. But like, do you think Pepe are going to adopt the strategies of other parties that have tapped into that because? You know, you need to mobilize uh, even young people that, that feel affected by that, uh, and that transfers to even other issues like immigration, maybe, or lack of jobs. Uh, you need to be very competent with social media, and I don't think Pepe are kind of garnering support through social media or, or tapping into that the way other people who've, been, who've done what he wants to do have done through that through that medium, yeah. you know? Um, well, so I think that's what they're trying to do, even if it's just with the image of a young guy and one uh, who is, like, similar or very similar to Ciudadanos, uh, which is the party that is trying to steal voters from them, you know? So I think they're just, they're just trying to, to give, and also to give an image of, like, new... Uh, you know, a new atmosphere for the party, that's why they've picked uh, somebody. Because in reality, um, the members of the party voted between the two candidates and they chose the other candidate, they didn't choose him. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't the one that got the most votes but uh, from the members. But then, according to their own rules, after the members vote, they have like a committee, a party committee vote. And even though the people had preferred the other woman, uh, their own party, you know. Yeah, but the party committee decided to go for him. But for example, if they want to give a fresh image, uh, surely, well, I know like they've had prominent female politicians before, but having someone, a new female leader, would have probably tapped into that as well, no? Giving the place a fresh air or a sense of, of change and newness. To be honest, I have a bit of a theory about the whole thing because 
the reason why it is in my personal opinion it, must, it might sound very like conspiracy theory like but I think you know the, the reason why Rajoy worked was because he was a bit of a puppet that's why he worked for so long because he could be managed by all the people that I don't know exactly who they are but there's obviously some people in the conservative party that are very powerful yeah. and they're the ones that really move the strings and they could do that easily with Rajoy and I think with Casado they can do it easily as well because superficially he seems you know very very modern very forward all that but I think he's made his way up through kind of like you know bothering people and stuff like that so, so yeah. I think they can mold it into mold him into whatever they want well, we'll see. I think that's what they're going for really well we'll see how that works out because I think one yeah. thing that Rajoy had in his favour and it, this was actually a big disadvantage was that he had he had a very uh, he had a proclivity for putting his foot in his mouth and saying stupid things. But he, if you have an idiot like that, or well, not an idiot perhaps, but somebody who is prone to a gaffe or an embarrassment, you know, it, it kind of helps that along a little bit. No, you have somebody who takes a lot of flack, and then behind the scenes, people can kind of pull the strings, as you say. But it's it, it's going to be determined whether this person will attract um, the attention like in that way, and if he doesn't. Will that dynamic still function in the party? I don't know. Well, yeah, but I mean, you have to think that this guy, uh, from the start, he's already been investigated for his masters. Oh, yeah, I've seen, yeah, I've seen he's it. He's already been for yeah. the same as we talked about. Uh, Cifuentes. Yeah, we talked about the president of uh, Madrid uh, before, and he's the same. He did the same masters, he didn't go to class either, yeah. and still he got the degree. So, I mean, it's not a great start, really, and he hasn't. The, the judge still like collating evidence so you know <laughs> it's not really the great the greatest star for somebody the president of a party so it's also yet to be seen how long he's actually going to last yeah well if if he is turfed out then because of this court ruling or whatever it's gonna it's gonna be a huge uh, image or PR disaster for Pepe yeah they should have thought of that as well you know but well they, they will have the reasons but I but, always get the impression there's a huge like power struggle within the party yeah but the thing yeah, well I, in most parties I, I assume there is but like I think as well you said that he wants to get in touch with the core voters or kind of win people back but having such an obvious example of going against the popular vote of their own party and going to the committee is again it's another example of a of a contradiction no and it remains to be seen whether people will will accept it or go along with it but what's your feeling are, are people at, a little put out by this uh Voting in, you, you know? know, I don't think so because the thing that I always uh, observe about the, the Conservative Party in Spain is that they have like this discipline that I find a bit scary, to be honest. But you know, even if they disagree or whatever, in the end, it's like a authoritarian ranks. father or whatever. You know, yeah. they, they still like uh, they won't they won't let others like see their weaknesses, and they will all like just stick together and pretend everything is fine, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's how that's how they've resisted for so long. I mean, I mean... Yeah, because but Amos have aired their dirty laundry. Uh, the problem that they left has is that they, they, they start historically in Spain, like they always start uh, breaking up over internal issues while the right just holds together. They might hate themselves or they might have like these enormous uh, power struggles, but they won't, you know, let yeah. that show. As, as much as they can. So. But the right are, are in, uh, in general are crafty anyway. Um, <laughs> they, they are because like, there's been a couple of stories in the media this week of uh, comedians who've been cut out because like conservative groups have basically trawled through their Twitter or their social media accounts. No, no, in America. Uh, for, 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 the, for the listeners who couldn't see that, really was, <laughs> was pointing at the floor of the car, which I think represented... Here in my car? Uh, in my car? <laughs> your car in Spain and Spain are clear of that, I think. Uh, two great territories. Um, no, in America, and like some of the, like some of the things that they unearthed like, are, are not really very nice, but, uh, but the fact that there's a culture there of... Uh, uh, crazy drivers there. Um, so it wasn't necessary. <laughs> don't worry. All part of the magic of the podcast. Um, so, but no, like, so some of the things that they've unearthed, and like Dan Harmon, for example, has been caught up in this as well, have been a little bit unpleasant. But the fact that there's a whole culture out there of, of conservatives and right wingers, kind of like looking for dirt on liberals, uh, it's a real international problem. So I think you just like they're they are crafty. They're craftier and more ring savvy. 
in the lift, unfortunately. But and they're not afraid of using dirty tactics. But uh, um, I don't know. I think it's going to trudge on, isn't it? I mean, even though we're talking about this, it's going to you know the people who are Pepe supporters are going to be Pepe supporters. And it's very hard to shake that out of them, and then you've got the people who are Sudanus or, or Podemos, and even though things change, people are already really set in their in their lines, no? Uh, even more so in the right, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're less changeable. Yeah, I think that's just true in a lot of mm. countries as well. Mm. Um, okay, so it's been... Uh, how better to celebrate the summer than to talk about academia and, and politics. <laughs> and politics. So, uh, yeah, so thank you so much um, for... Thank you for this part too, and this car journey full of spills, trills, and blowing klaxons. And we'll be talking to you momentarily in part three. So. Welcome to part three. We have a wonderful view of the city um, and lots of trees. It's a very well cultivated park. So props to the gardener. Mm-hmm. I think you should put on record as well your thanks to the gardener or the gardening team. Well, thank you to the gardening team. Excellent. That's <laughs> very, very sincere. <laughs> what do we have you, I mean? Uh, so we're, we're off to actually go on this free train. It's going to go on a huge loop around the park and the destinations we're going to see, we're going to enjoy. Um, different part. The, there's no names. I don't know. It's just like uh, there's like huge sculptures all over the place. That's, and... that's very true. We're going to see a huge auditorium as well. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so you know what? It's the summer, so we're going to go. Uh, my taxi's waiting. Your Uber is ready to take you north first. Where's <laughs> it out first? Uh, get your bags packed. So thank you so much for following us. For the last season and for longer if you have been a long time listener. You can find us now on Player FM as well. We've been rebooted on that platform. Uh, find us on all the usual places. LRPmedia.com is our website. Instagram, YouTube, Patreon, uh, Google Circles or whatever the hell it is. Uh, <laughs> we're there as well. Google Plus, that's the Circles one. Circles and squares. Um, so you can find us on all those spots. Uh, so enjoy your summer holidays. We will be back in two weeks. Rejuvenated, recuperated, ready for another season of barnstorming, brain tickling, cultural chit chat based on things in and outside Madrid. <laughs> uh, so, Mary, sign People us off there. Talk. <laughs> People will talk. For more buzzwords and slogans for our back catalogue, <laughs> tune in for season six. Give you a in two weeks. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. The Alarpa Podcast, the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. <laughs>